Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable session on turning the tide on the plastic wave material substitutes to single use plastics in developing countries. So my name is Carolyn Deer Burbeck. I am the director of the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs test based here in Geneva. It's our great pleasure to have supported UNCTAD in the organization of this event and to partner with them on their excellent work to support plastic free ocean economies and sustainable manufacturing in developing countries. Now, UNCTAD, as you may know, was just granted by governments its most environmentally sustainable mandate ever. Um, there's a focus in its new mandate on reducing uh, waste, including by moving away um, from a linear economy towards more sustainable patterns of production and consumption. There's an emphasis on the circular economy um, and finding opportunities to reuse and recycle materials and reduce pressures on the environment uh, in addition, the circular economy, um, uh, UNCTAD has been mandated to address the discharge of plastic litter and other waste in oceans and significantly reducing marine pollution of all kinds. And you'll see that UNCTAD has published a new paper today on enabling concerted multilateral action on plastic pollution and plastic substitutes. So at TESS, we work to promote dialogue and action on the nexus of trade, environment and sustainable development with the goal of supporting a trading system that addresses global environmental crises and advances the UN Sustainable Development Goals. A key area of our work is on the nexus of trade and plastic pollution and identifying ways in which work on this topic can address the priorities of developing countries. So at this roundtable today, we're delighted to have gathered speakers with different expertise um, related to the plastics challenges, challenge to discuss solutions that facilitate the substitution of single-use plastics by natural fibers and mineral materials in developing countries. It's also an opportunity to discuss insights from an upcoming study by ANCLAD, which is part of their Sustainable Manufacturing and Environmental Pollution Program, sponsored by the UK uh, Foreign Office, uh, which explores the potential of substitute materials in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, and has some great case studies on Bangladesh, Kenya, and Nigeria. So this uh, session today is part of growing interest in Geneva in work around plastic pollution. Um, and on this note, I'd also mentioned that uh, a wider set of dialogues called the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues, which may be of interest. And I believe that David will put in the chat shortly an invitation to a related event on plastic waste in mountains. And there are several others in that series. So we have a fairly tight program. So I'll introduce our speakers and then we can dive in. Please do send any questions or post any materials you have that may be relevant directly in the chat. So we'll begin today with a 15 minute presentation by Mahesh uh, Sugatan, who is a senior policy advisor at TESS and has been working closely uh, with UNCTAD to support their work um, in, this area, in this area. He's going to present an overview of some of the issues, challenges and opportunities for trade policy tools to promote substitutes to single use plastics based on a recent study um, that he's undertaken uh, for UNCTAD. And then we'll have commentary from three speakers, uh, Daniela Garcia, who is a deputy permanent representative, the mission, permanent mission of Ecuador to the WTO in Geneva, followed by Alice Tipping, who is a lead on sustainable trade and fisheries at IISD, and followed by Mr. Apit Bhutani, who is the chief operating officer of the Circular Innovation Lab and a managing partner at Hind Agro Sales. Uh, in India. So without further ado, I'll turn firstly to you, Mahesh, to tell us a little bit about your findings so far. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'll just share my screen as well. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, So great, uh, so good afternoon again, and uh, great to be here. Uh, I'd also like to thank UNCTAD for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of the findings of the study that uh, we at TESS uh, did for UNCTAD. Uh, and it's going to be a sort of a context setting study, looking what are the sort of trade tools for material transition to promote trade supported diffusion of plastic substitutes. So I'll get straight into it. Uh, so the, 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 what is the big context that we are looking at? 
I mean, we all know that plastics are widespread and they play a very useful role in the global economy, but it's also well recognized that there are adverse environmental impacts that are caused by the improper disposal and waste management of, of these plastics. Uh, plastic pollution has a big negative impact on marine ecosystems on, and marine life, and also on, on human, human and animal health as well. Um, one of the biggest, uh, the worst categories in this regard are single-use plastics. Now, what are single-use plastics? According to UNEP, they are also referred to as disposable plastics because once they're commonly used for plastic packaging, they are intended to be used only once before they are thrown away or recycled. So single-use plastic pollution has been found in beaches all around the world, and um, you know, you're, you're well aware of some of the, the negative impacts that it's caused. Now, why do we want to look at substitutes for single-use plastics? There are basically three imperatives that I'm gonna mention. The first is that the use of plastics for a particular application may be useful and convenient, but inappropriate because of the short lifetime of use and the adverse environmental impacts that they cause uh, because of inadequate waste management in many countries, but particularly in the developing world. Now, the reality is that in many developing countries, uh, setting up this infrastructure is going to take a long time, as well as the, the facilities to manage plastic waste are inadequate. Now, because of the long time it will take to develop some of this infrastructure, it might be better for these countries to look at options to replace these single-use plastic products with substitutes, in the, at least in the short to medium term. Now, thirdly, there are sustainable development and livelihood opportunities for developing countries that these plastic substitutes might offer. Now, there's a Pew report recently that looked at the role that different types of intervention could play in order to reduce plastic leakage to the ocean by 2040. Now, in this uh, particular slide, what we see is that the substitution of, of plastic by compostable materials would uh, constitute about 70, would, could prevent about 17% of plastic waste generated by 2040 which is equivalent to about 71 million metric tons of plastic. Now, 95% of this potential substitution comes from key product applications so which known materials already exist at some level of scale. Now, these include materials like monomaterial films, other rigid monomaterial packing, sachets and multi-layer films, carrier bags, pots, tubs and trays, and food service disposables. So while it, I mean, while there are a number of, so, the switch to substitute is only one of many interventions that can take place, but as you can see that, you know, 17% is not an insignificant amount. So, I, so, so countries would be, I mean, it would be really good for countries to look at what kind of substitutes could be, uh, could replace these single-use plastics. Now, what about SDGs? Now, there are, lot, there are SDG goals and targets which provide a good hook for pursuing options on, on replacing single-use plastics. One of them is SDG 12, which looks at ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns, and also SDG 14, which calls for conserving and sustainably using the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Now, where, what exactly are plastic substitutes and where can we draw the boundaries for the universe of plastic substitutes? So going a bit into the definition and scope, we could broadly look at two sort of materials. The first is traditional materials, which are based on naturally occurring polymers that are found in animals and plants, such as cellulose, chitin, and lignin, lignin as well as non-renewable mineral resources found in nature, such as clay and mica. Or we could also look at materials which are synthetic or semi-synthetic in nature. Now, the, the issue with the latter category is that while the latter category is derived from, could be maybe derived from natural plants or animals, they are usually blended with chemicals or they undergo chemical treatment or mechanical processing, which alters their structure. So that means that without having proper infrastructure facilities in place to treat this sort of plastic, it will be very difficult for countries to actually manage these, this sort of waste properly. So that's why in this presentation, as well as in the study, we focus on the first sort of materials, which are essentially traditional materials, which are fully compostable and which don't need this additional infrastructure to handle them. Now, looking at the universe of substitutes, I mean, we find that there are a wide range of uh, materials from which plastic substitutes can be produced. These include uh, some of them which are well-established, for example, jute uh, and 
Cecil, et cetera. But there are also others which are fairly nascent. For example, there's algae and there's you know, weeds, uh, products like wheat straws, et cetera. So now the, the thing is whether uh, countries could also look at these other new emerging materials as well. There are examples of companies which have started producing some of these uh, plastic substitutes from, from alternative materials. For example, Ananas Anam is a UK-based company with subsidiaries in the Philippines and Spain, which uses pineapple leaves, which are blended with 20% polylactic acid to produce a material called Pinatex, which can be used as a substitute for products made out of leather or poly polymer-based le leather substitutes, such as shoes, bags, furniture. There are other companies, for example, which produce plast, uh, water sachets from algae. But these are examples of very nascent products, and there's still a long way to go before they can be commercially made commercially viable in the market. Now, in the third category on the right side, you, you can also see that they're non-mineral feedstocks, which are essentially glass, clay, ceramics, and aluminum. Now, there is a problem with uh, disposal for some of these categories as well. I mean, they do take a long time to, to, to biodecompose in the soil, but at the same time, they are easily re recyclable. And one of the good things, which also my colleague Henrique will be presenting more in his presentation is that developing countries already have in place infrastructure facilities to recycle some of these materials. So compared to plastics, there could be a case for actually switching where it makes sense from these uh, single use plastics to, so to these mineral based feedstocks as well. Now, what could be some criteria for selecting appropriate substitutes? There are a number of criteria which could be explored. First is domestic feedstock availability and existing production of these feed materials. Environmental footprints for mater these materials based on life cycle analysis, durability and functionality, whether those materials are recompostable, reusable or recyclable. The techno-economic feasibility of some of these materials, including pricing. What is the existing regulatory frameworks, taxes, incentives in place, which discourage single use plastics and promote substitutes? What are the trade policy frameworks in place, such as import duties, non-tariff measures, et cetera? Now, these are a complex set of criteria, and obviously there has to be, there will be some level of trade-off. For example, I mean, if you look at functionality, uh, a lot of the plastic substitutes may not completely achieve perfect functionality in terms of the desired end users, but at the same time, they might have a lot of environmental benefits. So there will have to be a sort of a judgment call on where using some of these substitutes makes perfect sense and where they may not make that much of, uh, of sense. Now, looking at some examples of substitute feedstocks, I'll uh, go into a bit of detail on jute, abaca, coir, kenaf, and sisal, which are commonly known as JAX fibers. Now, these fibers are fairly well established in developing countries. And that's the reason why we also have uh, very good data on some of the trade flows and the production as well. Now, looking at the, the producers, we see that developing countries are fairly well established in some of the, the production as well as the, the exports of these, these JAX fibers. Uh, some of the fibers are more concentrated in some countries than others. So for example, jute and coir, jute is predominantly produced in Bangladesh and India, coir is produced in India and Sri Lanka. Whereas if you look at sea cell, there's a lot more developing countries which are active as, as producers for these. So these are sort of the established figures. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is also because it's easier to identify these uh, JAX fibers as part of any sort of trade negotiations or, or market access negotiations going ahead. Some of the other products which are fairly nascent, you know, for example, like algae or whether it's uh, uh, products made out of banana leaves, for example, they're very, they're much more difficult to identify in the, in the Harmony system. Now, what could be some trade-related tools to promote these plastic substitutes? Uh, first, I'll, I'll come to import tariffs. So import duties are a strong instrument by which countries can either discourage or encourage the import of many of these substitute products. So for example, when we look at JAX fibers, we see that a lot of countries uh, have zero duties, for example, on some of the feedstocks, but they have much higher duties on the value-added products. Now, in general, what we find is that large developing countries apply higher tariffs on JAX fibers, and particularly on related manufactured goods. However, even in developed countries such as the EU, there is scope for further reduction in duties for certain value-added products, such as square floor matting and ropes of sea and abaca. 
There's also scope for relaxing rules of origin for products in some of the preferential schemes, for example, EU's generalized system of preferences and everything but ARM schemes. So relaxing rules of origin means that a lot more developing countries can benefit from the market access that is granted because the, the rules with regard to processing and setting up value addition facilities, et cetera, would be fairly relaxed. Now, in addition to tariffs, what might even be more important as a barrier to some market access in plastic substitutes are non-tariff measures and standards. Now, in terms, while we're discussing standards, we have to be very clear about the differentiation between um, the different types of materials that are advertised. So for example, you have materials which are bio-based, there are materials which are biodegradable, there are materials which are compostable, oxodegradable, recyclable, recycled, so there are all these different claims that can be made for products based on these criteria. Some products might share one or more of these criteria. Some products may not, uh, may not share, may, may share just one of them. So it has, there has to be very clear uh, standards or thresholds set for how producers are able to claim a certain product as bio-based or biodegradable. And unfortunately, we don't have that kind of uh, uniform rules in place. Uh, so, so one more thing is again, uh, which are the main standard setting organizations um, that, that could be relevant for discussing standards of plastic substitutes? One of them is ISO, uh, which sets the ISO standards. There's ASTM International and there's the European Committee for Standardization. Now, most of the standards they're currently involved in and very active in are looking at uh, plastics specifically and looking at the, the chemical content of the plastics, biodegradability, compostability, et cetera. But I think there is also a case to be made for these standard setting bodies getting a lot more active in setting standard standards and criteria, even for a lot, even for the plastic substitute products. Now, what are some of the, uh, the differences between standard certification label and claim? Standard refers to specific criteria or norms of material goods or services, including packaging, which may also serve as benchmarks. I mean, there are mandatory standards which could be set by governments and there are also voluntary sustainability standards that could be set by the private sector. Certification refers to the formal accreditation process. Uh, label is a logo or stamp which highlights a product or service's specific characteristic, which could be also used as a form of trademark. A label may or may not represent a certification. A claim would refer to assertions made by companies about the beneficial qualities or characteristics of their goods and services. So it's also useful for to differentiate between these different sort of uh, nomenclatures when it comes to discussing standards. Um, what are some of the non-tariff measures that might impact the exporters of JAX fibers? I mean, these include SPS measures, sanitary and phytosanitary measures that might include fumigation requirements, for example, packaging crates made of uh, of, of jute or sisal or, or, or other um, substitute materials, customs and administrative procedures, import licensing procedures, et cetera. For example, there has been some requirements uh, in, in Australia, for example, which, uh, which uh, requires the producers of some of these substitute materials to actually use uh, crops or use feedstocks which are pesticide free, which means in the production process of some of these products, you cannot be using any sort of pesticides at all. So these are just some examples of, um, of non-tariff measures. One of the important things to note is the upcoming, the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, uh, which although the impacts might be more on plastic and bioplastic materials, there might also be impacts on packaging materials which are made of substitute uh, materials as well. So this would be an important law to, uh, to monitor and to see what would be the implications for uh, exporters of, of substitutes going forward, including developing countries. Uh, the other thing also I've, uh, sorry, should mention is the requirements to ensure food quality and safety. Now, this means that often plastics might be indispensable, especially for countries that want to export fresh produce uh, like food and flowers, et cetera. And there has to be some research and development perhaps that could help to see which kind of substitutes might actually help maintain these qualities. I mean, maybe they may not need these qualities to the same extent as single-use plastics, but may, there might be other materials which could. So perhaps that, that's something that is also important because um, a lot of these food packaging materials are single-use plastics where, you know, once you open the container, you would just throw away the plastic. 
And, and because of the fact that trade in these products you know, happens in both developed and developing countries, that obviously leads to implications for, 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 for plastic waste, for generation of single-use plastic waste. Now, what is the second tool that we can look at? One of them is to ensure the clarity and visibility of some of these plastic substitutes within the harmonized system at the, WS, the, at the World Customs Organization. What we find is that the level of precision of the harmonized system varies quite widely with regard to the raw materials. So for example, products like jute have very clearly defined HS codes at the six digit level. Uh, they also clearly define codes for end use products like jute bags and sisal ropes. There is no similar uh, clear definition for other uh, feedstocks that might be interesting, for example, banana or areca leaves, for, for example. There's also no subheading that could precisely capture certain other products. For example, aluminum bottles could be classified under three different subheadings. Uh, you know, aluminum casts, drums, cans, and boxes, uh, table, kitchen, or other household articles, or other articles of aluminum. So for certain products, it might be that customs might actually be classifying uh, in, in each country very differently for the, for the same sort of substitute. Now, what can be done at the World Customs Organization? One of the issues at the WCO is that for a new HS six-digit classification to be uh, to come into effect, uh, the product has to cross a certain trade threshold, which is usually 100 million US dollars for a four-digit subheading and 50 million US dollars for a six-digit subheading. But at the same time, there has been precedent in the WCO to have separate classification systems based on social and environmental reasons. So one of the arguments could be that for certain kind of plastic substitutes, it might be worth looking at whether this criteria can be relaxed so that we have very clear uh, distinct subheadings for plastic substitutes that can facilitate not only trade, but also tracking data and monitoring, uh, monitoring by customs authorities of, of these uh, products. Now, um, what are, where could some of these trade policy initiatives, whether addressing tariffs, non-tariff measures, et cetera, be pursued? One option that countries always have are, is unilateral trade action, which means that each country takes its own steps to liberalize tariffs and non-tariff barriers as they see appropriate. They could also introduce non-discriminatory taxes, charges, and requirements, both on single-use plastics as well as substitutes. They could look at green procurement policies. <clears throat> they could look at liberalizing relevant waste services sectors, for example, industrial composting and waste management. Now, for products like bioplastic or polylactic acid. I mean, it's very well known that without industrial composting facilities, you cannot have expanded trade because expanded trade in PLA or bioplastic would only lead to the, will only lead to exacerbating the problem of pollution. So the chicken has to come first before the egg. I mean, so in this sense, the industrial composting facility will have to be set up before any sort of huge trade in bioplastics take place in, if you want to avoid those sort of adverse effects. So I would argue that maybe it might be worth exploring the traditional substitutes first in terms of market access and trade liberalization, rather than um, going all in for some of these new materials like bioplastics and so on. Now, the other avenue where trade liberalization could be pursued are plurilateral, bilateral, and regional trade initiatives. These include <clears throat> plurilateral initiatives such as the Environmental Goods Agreement. It could be bilateral agreements, including South-South RTAs, because as we have seen for some of the traditional fibers like Jack's fibers, developing countries themselves are the biggest importers of some of these products. So a South-South RTA would make perfect sense in terms of enabling other developing countries to access markets. And this also would include UNCTAD's Global System of Trade Preferences, GSTP. That was set up as a mechanism where developing countries would give preferential access to other developing countries. And perhaps there's also a case for this mechanism to be revived further. Finally, at the WTO, there's also opportunities to liberalize for environmental goods and services uh, that could be done multilaterally. There has al already been examples of many environmental preferable products <clears throat> proposed during the Doha round negotiations. These include products like jute sacks and bags, sisal ropes, paper and paper wood items, agglomerated cork, natural rubber, et cetera. So the, the WTO is always perhaps the best you know, way to avenue to pursue liberalization at a multilateral level. Uh, but obviously because of the, the time constraint and, and the long um, you know, time for negotiations, I mean, countries could also look at other avenues as well. The interest. What could be some of the other sub initiatives to sub sub uh, support plastic substitutes? 
There could be trade and investment related initiatives that look at recovery, recycling and composting, including through market access for relevant environmental services. This could cover not just traditional plastics, but also substitutes like aluminum, glass and other substitutes that might need recovering, recovery and recycling at scale. Now, one of the things that developing countries is that there is a lot of labor intensive models that are there for collecting these materials and managing them. So in terms of having uh, operations at scale or investment at scale, it would be good to see how some of those models could be integrated rather than displaced, because we are also talking about labor intensive activities where a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of livelihoods which depend on some of these traditional waste gathering and recycling activities. Uh, countries could also look at attracting foreign investment in the area of manufacturing plastic substitutes. Now, this especially makes sense for some of these new and emerging materials that I mentioned earlier, such as algae, for example, where developing countries might lack the know-how or the technology to, to put in place operations uh, to produce substitutes at scale. Um, uh, there could be access to technology and know-how, technical assistance and capacity building pursued through initiatives like Green Aid for Trade at the WTO where uh, there, there could be a, a focus. For example, one of the sectors of focus could definitely be plastic substitutes. Now, at the WTO, I'd specifically like to conclude by referring to the ongoing informal dialogue on plastics and environmentally substitutes plastics trade. Now, this initiative, this informal dialogue was launched in November 2020 among a group of uh, countries, and it was essentially a developing country-led initiative initiated by Fiji and China. And now since 2021, it has six co-conveners, Australia, Barbados, China, Ecuador, Fiji, and Morocco. Now, most recently, um, the IDP has come out with a ministerial statement for MC12, where they have looked at, uh, where they have actually looked at plastic substitutes as one of the areas for, for further work. Now, as you can see, there are 66 countries that have joined uh, this ministerial statement as co-sponsors and more countries are expected. Now, what are some of those references? I mean, firstly, uh, members have decided to intensify work on areas of common interest with a view to identifying actions that members could collectively take to support global efforts to reduce plastic pollution. And as you will see uh, in the sections that I've underlined, a lot of them refer to plastic substitutes. There's a reference to expanding trade in environmentally sustainable and effective substitutes and alternatives, development of access to environmentally sustainable and effective substitutes and alternatives to single-use plastics, developing and strengthening local capacities to produce uh, these substitutes. In addition, uh, there's also a reference to uh, aid for trade. So considering plastic pollution, environmentally sustainable plastics trade in aid for trade with environmentally sustainable objectives. There's a reference to work on standards, which are more for plastics, but they could also be relevant to plastic substitutes as well, uh, with a specific reference to initiatives such as the ISO, the Basel Convention, and the, the new ongoing um, Global Plastics Treaty, which will be discussed at the UNIA 5. Um, there's also reference to uh, work on customs um, classification, improving the harmonized system, again on plastics, but I would argue that there's also a case to be made for extending this to, to plastic substitutes as well eventually. Uh, and finally, to hold dedicated discussions with a view to identifying best practices and sharing experiences including regarding environmentally sustainable effective substitutes and alternatives, as well as identifying technologies for environmentally sustainable and effective substitutes and alternatives of interest to developing members and LDCs, including SIDS, which are especially vulnerable to marine litter and plastic pollution and opportunities for the MSMEs. So as you can see that the statement provides a very clear roadmap for a work program ahead on plastic substitutes. And I think it would be great if developing countries uh, pick up on this opportunity and engage more on how best they could look at ways of promoting plastic substitutes of interest to them, both at the WTO, but also looking at the other broader picture, which is essentially building capacity, access to technology, promoting the development dimension, et cetera. And with that, I'll end right now, but my colleague Henrique is gonna follow up looking more specifically at the case of three countries, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Nigeria. And I think some of the big picture issues that I discussed today, uh, you will get a more micro and granular, granular, granular level impact from Henrique in his presentation. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I look forward to your questions. 
Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mahesh. Really excellent um, presentation. And I was um, reluctant to intervene when the time was getting short because I, I really felt that it was really informative and useful. So great that you were so specific about which countries are existing producers in this area and where the opportunities might lie. And also some of the trade policy related constraints and also where trade policy can make a difference um, here. So um, without taking more time, I'm gonna turn directly to our three commentators. I'll start with uh, Daniela, and hopefully you can help us put this work also in context of the work that you're um, helping to lead at the WTO on the informal dialogue on plastic pollution. Daniela. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, thank you to uh, UNDAD, and thank you, Tess, for this very kind invitation. Um, thank you, Mahesh, the, the presentation um, was excellent and very clear, and it really uh, gives you um, a clear view of all the opportunities uh, beyond the challenges we have uh, to, to tackle plastic pollution, but certainly there is uh, a lot of opportunities for um, small uh, developing countries. Um, Thank you, I mean, for the research data and, and, and solutions. As I mentioned, we believe that trade can be a solution and, and contribute to address uh, this problematic uh, on plastic uh, pollution. And uh, we need to identify challenges, but also the economic opportunities for developing countries to explore uh, opportunities to support small, medium enterprises. Uh, and this can be, done, can be done certainly by including, uh, by supporting non-plastic substitutes an alternative and why not to explore the potential to identify export, uh, export opportunities uh, as well. As at the informal dialogue uh, of, plastics, uh, of plastics pollution and trade at the WTO, uh, we have covered six topics. Uh, many uh, of them were mentioned uh, when Mahesh did the presentation and the importance related to substitutes, uh, an alternative, uh, improving transparency and monitoring trade trends promoting best practices, strengthening policy coherence, identifying the scope for collective approaches, and assessing capacity and technical needs, uh, technical assistance needs. Uh, needs. Uh, also, of course, cooperating with other international processes and efforts. Uh, when we talk about, and this was uh, very clear in the presentation of Mahesh, and, and, and thank you again, uh, when we talk about addressing trade-related capacity building and technical assistance, uh, needs for developing members, in particular LDCs and vulnerable uh, small island developing states. Uh, we have included uh, one uh, particular issue, uh, expand trading environmentally sustainable and effective substitutes and alternative. Uh, now, the tools and, and options and how uh, we get to that, uh, we have a still, we have a very clear roadmap in terms of our declaration, but still we need to put um, to, to, to hold discussions and certainly the stakeholders on that and this uh, expertise will be instrumental to advance on this. But just giving uh, some idea on what the declaration and what our discussions came into um, conclude when we were talking about uh, exploring uh, the opportunities about training substitutes and alternative and sustainable and effective substitutes and alternatives. So encourage collaboration with the relevant stakeholders through inter alia the, the exchange of knowledge and experience related to the development uh, and uh, of an access to environmentally sustainable and effective, including cost and functionality effective, cost was one of the things that were discussed uh, during our dialogue, substitutes, but also alternative to single use plastics. Uh, the other thing was to develop and strengthen local capabil capacities to produce environmentally sustainable and effective substitutes and alternative to single use plastics. And of course, through the facilitation, uh, through, through facilitating access to key technologies, including innovative technologies. So transfer uh, access to key technologies is a very important issue as well. So beyond, but beyond the need for national regional studies uh, and uh, on potential market opportunities, financing, we need to make sure these products reach potential markets. And a very important point was made by, 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 by Mahesh uh, with, with the presentation, a tariff and uh, non-tariff barriers uh, are definitely issues to address when we talk about trade. And uh, also packaging requirements, for example, there you have policy coherence, transparency and visibility uh, in, as important part of this equation. and. Uh, the important areas where we need to find uh, trade tools to, uh, to, to, 
to access uh, markets, markets and, and find opportunities for small developing countries. And even if the discussions can advance regionally or multilaterally at the WTO, I think the IDP and, uh, and that's uh, what, where we can see the IDP as a platform in the WTO to engage with other organizations in terms of finding solutions. We need to also engage with the ISO, uh, with the WCO, uh, but also with the private sector and uh, relevant stakeholders in different areas and topics. Uh, so I think uh, I, I really thank the study from UNCTAD because it has, done, it has done an amazing job in identifying concrete opportunities for a subset of countries, uh, developing countries uh, that uh, some are already part of the IDP and we hope some others uh, will join uh, soon because we need to see trade not, not only as part of the problem, but also as part of the solution. And uh, just to mention uh, about our conversations when we had our dialogue in June about collective approaches and uh, cooperation in terms of uh, uh, how trade can contribute to tackle plastic pollution, uh, we had a very important um, experience uh, shared from uh, the Latin American Integration Association. Uh, they mentioned two rounds uh, two rounds of trade discussions. Uh, we call that those business rounds that were relevant in 2021 to address plastic pollution in the region. And they call these rounds creative industries and information um, and, and, and digital uh, technologies in terms of uh, how we move to a more sustainable uh, trade. So within Latin America, they um, focus their rounds, these business rounds, in how to uh, address opportunities in terms of substitutes. But also other countries, uh, for example, SEEDS have brought this to the discussion, how uh, plant and animal fiber value chains uh, can, can support to, to, to this, uh, this uh, map to this issue, and how we can better support SMEs uh, uh, to reach markets and economies of scales. Anyways, um, I won't, uh, ex I won't uh, talk more about uh, this issue, but we certainly uh, thank you. Uh, we certainly thank UNTAD and TESS and, and ready to engage in, uh, with, with any country that would like to know more about the informal dialogue on plastics, um, pollution and trade. And certainly uh, thank you, Carolyn, again, and, and Enrique, David and, and Mahesh. Great, thank you so much. Uh... Daniela, and thank you also for um, your endorsement that this work is really useful um, for developing country governments and the uh, governments that you're working with in the IDP process. I'm sure that that's the underlying motivation for both UNCTAD and TESS is to make sure that we're producing work that is useful and can support countries in their efforts um, to reduce plastic pollution. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to Alice Tipping, who's also um, been a really valuable uh, analyst and thinker behind the scenes in 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 uh, working through ways that we can use trade policy uh, to support uh, reduce plastic pollution. And so I'd like to turn to Alice now um, from IASD. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Carolyn, and thank you very much uh, to Tess and to Unted for the invitation to join this roundtable. Um, and uh, as Caroline says, we've been following the plastics debate for some time and working uh, on some pieces of analysis that have gone into the discussion so far. Um, so the report that Carolyn and Mahesh uh, have already spoken to and Daniela's talked about, I think I've been lucky enough to see part of an executive summary, and I think it's a really useful piece of analysis. So I do encourage you uh, to spend some time, perhaps over your Christmas holiday, reading it when it um, comes out or in January, uh, because I think it's a really useful input to the policy discussion. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the report and some of the some of the pieces of the analysis have been highlighted already, but I'll talk about why I think it's it's a useful piece of analysis, uh, and then I'll come back to some of the trade points that Mahesh was talking about in his presentation. I suppose the first question though is why is it important to talk about plastic substitutes, right? Why does the idea, why do plastic substitutes really matter? Um, and at least as, as I see it, and it's kind of is ideas born of discussions I've had over the last few days as well, is that they really are key to the transition that governments want to undertake, right? I mean, plastic is so successful precisely because it meets many of our needs very well, right? The need to hold and transport food and drink, the need to package and protect things we don't want broken, the need to create things, buildings and lighting systems and TVs and my iPhone. 
So if we don't have a substitute that we can use instead of plastic, it becomes very difficult for governments and consumers to simply do without things that we've become accustomed to having, right? So it's a crucial part of the, pol the political and the policy work that needs to be done to address a global economy that's already awash with plastic. So I think th the report is really useful in advancing the discussion on plastic substitutes for a number of reasons. Um, and the first is that it focuses on three developing countries, as Carolyn was saying at the beginning, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Nigeria, where plastic is an important part of the waste stream. Um, I was reading in the report, it's around 12% in Kenya's case. And the focus on developing countries, I think, matters because solutions for developing countries aren't going to have the luxury of having lots of financial and lots of human resources devoted to them. And because I think there's a particular argument in the developing country case for having homegrown solutions, right? homegrown substitutes that contribute to other imperative development objectives like employment in particular. So I think the focus on, on those three countries makes a lot of sense and they're well chosen. Um, secondly, the report takes a sort of a life cycle analysis approach and Mahesh was referring to this briefly at the beginning and this is I'm sure something that we'll, we'll get into in the, the later presentations. And I think that's important because it looks, it, it forces us as policy makers and policy thinkers to look not just at the potential benefits in terms of reduced plastic use, but also at the trade-offs of environmental impacts across both the life cycle of plastic production and the life cycle of its alternative, right? So what this leads to, I think, is, is important findings that put in a holistic context, the different policy choices that policymakers, or the different choices, I suppose, that, that are embedded in the options that the policy, that the report talks about. Um, and I think that matters because it gives policymakers a clear view of what they might have to trade off, right, in terms of other environmental impacts if they want to incentivize a shift to alternatives. And I think it's important that we don't shy away from understanding those trade-offs, right? That the knowledge of them means that policymakers and the politicians know where they're going and can defend policy decisions if resistance to them emerges, as it often does. Um, so I think the, the kind of the holistic approach and a very cool-headed sense of what we're trading off and why, what, what, what we're trading off makes sense because it then allows policymakers to decide what trade-offs they want to undertake and why. Um, and the last reason I think the report is, 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 a, is a useful piece of analysis is that it then applies this techno-economic assessment of alternatives. Um, and this is something Mahesh mentioned in, in one, of his, one of his slides, right? So the question, it, it, the report asks the question of, can the feasible alternatives actually be produced domestically? And how much can they really displace the plastic that's currently used? And so that gives us, I think, a really clear view of the possibilities for using domestically produced paper in Nigeria or jute bags in Bangladesh or glass in all three countries. And that again is an important piece of the puzzle for policymakers, right? Um, so, you know, not just this would be nice to do, but what am I really trading off and how much impact could that change actually, actually achieve in my economy? And what else do I need to do in terms of flanking policies to make sure that the shift to the substitute that I would like to shift to, uh, you know, actually has an impact and actually achieves the results I want. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the design of the report is really interesting because it gives you that clear sighted view of the substitutes and the possibilities. And the trade policy analysis, which is what Mahesh was talking to, is also really interesting. Um, and it throws up, I think, some quite important questions, right? So, you know, if you are, what, do your, what does your tariff profile look like, right? It's kind of where, where a lot of trade policy starts. Um, you know, do you have much lower tariffs on plastic feedstocks? than you do on natural product feedstocks. And what are you trading off there? Are you perhaps making it even more difficult for some of your natural product producers to get off the ground right, and compete against plastic, uh, you know, plastic products driven by those cheaper feedstocks? So, you know, so there's, there's an interesting tariff question there. Um, and so there's a, obviously sort of a, an initial question about how can we use tariffs and other forms of trade regulation to expand the domestic market, our own market for an alternative, if that's where we want to shift. But there's an also, there's, and Mahesh was talking to this as well. It's also, I think about expanding the global market 
for your alternative, be it a jute bag or be it you know, paper bags. Um, and so there's an important idea in the report about expanding preferential trade agreements with large developing countries, right, beyond the, the developed countries that currently provide them. The idea, I think, being that if you, it's important not just to create a larger domestic market for your alternative, but if you could create a larger global market for the alternative, the good that you want to promote, you enable production of that alternative at scale, right, which makes it cheaper everywhere. But there are also a couple of other important things that need to be considered if you want to make that, that global market for your alternative really work. And the paper talks about them, right? It talks about the need to ensure that the standards applied to the production of that alternative are accessible so that developing country producers can use those standards to service the market that you've created um, with, your, with your expanded preferential, preferential scheme, for example. Um, and Mahesh spoke to this, right, including, you know, thinking about the requirements around the use of plastic and packaging for fresh products, uh, the example of the use of pesticides and natural fiber products, right, are the standards applied to your newly, la newly large market for your alternative, are they really accessible, do they work? And the second part of it is that it is useful to have HS codes that are detailed enough to show us how much of this substitute, how much of this alternative is actually being traded. And that I've always thought is important because you, you want to understand where demand is being met and also to see where trade isn't happening, where you might expect it to happen, right? So then you can dig into perhaps why isn't it happening, right? Why is, why is the market not working the way I thought it might when I, tw when I changed my policy levers in this following direction? Um, so I think there are good ideas in the report about how that could be done. Um, and I think it's, it's a useful report that combines both very sort of practical, cool-headed policy advice um, and examples of how specific kinds of policies can be tweaked to encourage um, so to encourage particular alternatives and substitutes, um, and a useful piece of trade policy advice as well, right? Because it, it links right. together. That's it. Thank Karen. you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alice, and a great review, and, and so happy that the report is so useful. I have been not such a good moderator today because I'm not keeping everyone to time. So um, I promise, David, that we'll be done in five minutes. Meanwhile, there are some questions in the chat, Mahesh. So I would suggest that maybe you could just reply to them in the chat directly because we won't have time for the Q&A at this point. But what I will do is turn directly to our pits, please, for your reflections. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, everybody. So I basically wear two hats, one being a circular economy and a trade professional and, uh, and being uh, managing the packaging uh, business of the family. Uh, I mean, it's easier said than done, to be very honest. When I used to uh, be on the other side alone and, and I used to think about it, it was improving the standards, all of that is very, very, uh, looks very easy, but it's very, very difficult. And I'll give you a very few practical challenges we are facing. Uh, first of all, when, when we look at uh, single-use plastics, there is not enough research that has happened when it comes to food contamination and uh, the newer materials that are coming in. Plastics has been there for several decades and there has been enough research that especially polypropylene has been very, very good and safe for consumption of baby products or our food packaging. So there's a lot of uh, issue with respect to standards that is there. For instance, I, we, we went to the Indian government and told, uh, told them that we want to include recycled plastics in our food packaging. And uh, we were told we're not allowed to do that because uh, it's completely banned to do it. There is no research that's there. So definitely, the, like Mahesh had pointed out, standards need to be uh, quickly adapted to and, and technology and standards have to move together to move forward uh, in this transition. Another major thing which I see is that we, we, when, we, when we move to alternative materials, we must not abuse them for sure. I mean, when we were in when we were using paper, we we moved to plastics because paper paper was causing a lot of deforestation, and and uh, then and plastic initially was very good. We were reusing it again and again, but we then messed it up. So we cannot do that for the newer materials. So I think the the ma the major issue in rather than just the uh, uh, you know al al alternative material is to kind of disrupt the take make dispose model, uh, which which is which is the key to it. When it comes to cost implications to on moving to alternative materials, we see, often see the discussion of, focuses on what is the cost of the material per se per kilogram. That that obviously reduces down when when there is economies of scale. 
I think the major and the larger issue is the, in, the investment that has gone into fixed assets of an industry of when using plastics. Uh, I'll give an example. We imported machine, uh, German uh, machinery, injection molding machinery and robots three years ago. An average lifespan of these machinery is around 20 years. And, and now there's the new alternative materials are coming in. We are very scared if the new machinery and the new machines are, would, would they be able to you know, be utilized in this new uh, packaging which we are going to develop? So, uh, so, so I think the transition for the industry uh, while, while, while ensuring that they can use their existing infrastructure and assets is something that is very important when we talk about technology and innovation. Uh, when, when it comes to we, would we like to import alternative packaging material from abroad? I mean, India being a big, big manufacturer of plastic resins, we still need to do it because the, the, the grade I want is not manufactured in India. So we, we, we import it from Dubai. Ideally, we do not want to import. Like, like Alice, uh, Alice said, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to buy local and considering COVID has actually taught us that uh, the supply chains can be disrupted anytime and we would ideally want to buy it locally, but there are several challenges to it. Uh, and the challenges are, I would, I would uh, for instance, we, I, I'll show you my packaging and just quickly do it. Uh, initially, what we used to do is we used to uh, have this material made of HDPE and the label out of it was made of uh, LDP, uh, LDPE. Now we moved to the packaging being polypropylene and the label being polypropylene as a single mono material. So we moved, it was easier for recycling to happen. Now we want to move a little ahead. On the top of it, we have aluminum packaging, which has poly in it because it helps in sealing. We want to move, move, move away from that for two reasons. One is obviously environment reason. The other is major reason is economics. Aluminum is very expensive uh, at this moment and we don't want to proceed with that. So we approached some of the alternative suppliers in India. They could not help us out. So we approached somebody again in Germany and they gave us this. This is a paper kind of a material, which, is, uh, which, is, which can also be sealed on top, uh, which, which is not the usual paper quality. It is a patented technology. Now, the cost of this is more expensive than the whole packaging bottle. So I could not proceed with that. Next, we went to China. They did amazing uh, reverse uh, suppliers, reverse uh, engineering, and were ready to provide us with this. But then the trade tensions between India and China did not allow us to move uh, uh, to buy it from there. So now we are exploring newer opportunities for this. So there are definitely these kind of challenges that are there, uh, but but we are confident, positive and confident that we'll make it something that happen. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't have my unmute. Thank you so much, Arpit. And so interesting to have a very concrete example from India. I mean, your focus was more on the um, the use of sort of alternative plastics or to try and redesign um, plastic products. Um, but I think that alongside the, this emphasis on plastic substitutes, that's something that's also going to have to be part of the solution mix. And as you say, using more recycled um, content where we can and reducing uh, the range of materials in a single product to facilitate um, their recyclability. Um, so that's really key. But I really thought what was interesting, which would be great to discuss further another time, is your emphasis on how the trade policy frameworks and wider landscape was affecting your capacity uh, to shift in the direction you wanted. And also, I think, critically, this issue of access to technology at an affordable price. And so I think here, I know that one of the issues that in the IDP, the governments will be discussing is looking around issues of how do you access affordable and appropriate technologies or be able to adapt them to local circumstances um, and needs. And so I think here there are issues obviously around licensing and technology transfer and also intellectual property issues, as well as Mahesh mentioned around financing. You know, And so I think it's really great actually that we had your practical example at the end of how all these somewhat um, sometimes can seem abstract policy discussions actually play out in a really, um, in a specific uh, case. So I fear that we won't have time um, to do questions as such, but Mahesh, could I offer you one minute at the end just to wrap up with any reflections that you have on the comments from our, our colleagues here? Yeah. Sure, I'd be happy to. 
Yes, sorry. <clears throat> sorry, I just uh, quickly wrap up. No, I think uh, I was just responding to some of the questions in the chat. I, I think they're really interesting questions. And I think uh, one, maybe three, a uh, couple of points I might want to just sort of take away is that firstly, uh, the issue needs a lot more work. So we do need to have a lot more analysis of some of the issues and what kind of substitutes are out there, what kind of barriers to developing countries face. I mean, as there was one question from Ron, which I was looking at where, I mean, the environmental impacts definitely differ according to the material that we are looking at. So we really need to carefully consider what exactly, which material we should, we should be considering. Uh, but finally, I would say that there is a lot of opportunity for trade. And I think it's that we are really at the surface. I mean, there's a lot more um, exploring to do and a lot more, I would say maybe it might be good for countries to sort of go back introspect domestically as to maybe what kind of potential feed, feedstocks that they might have in their economy that could be worth tapping into, and then sort of looking at that and pushing that at the global scale in markets. So there's a lot of work to be done, I think, both at the domestic level for identification of substitutes, for the development of the, the regulatory structure and the incentive framework, and finally, on looking at what are the trade opportunities and trade policy actions that can be pursued. So I'll, I'll wrap it up. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mahesh. And thank you also uh, to Arpit and to Daniela and to Alice, each of you for really adding value, I think, to Mahesh's presentation by zooming in on some of the, the opportunities, the political perspectives, some of the trade-offs and tensions at hand that Alice raised, and also some of the practical um, challenges and also opportunities uh, that Arpit uh, put forward for us. So I think that this session has been um, an optimistic one, but there, there's, there's definitely scope for more work and analysis in this area. Um, and the reason that's worth doing is because there's a chance to make a real difference um, to plastic pollution by promoting plastic substitutes and also to make a difference to developing countries in terms of generating and supporting local communities, local employment um, and industrial development in countries uh, themselves. So um, all around, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And now I will turn to uh, David Vivas to take you through the second part of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And thank you very much for all the speakers of the previous session. It has been very interesting. Now we're going to the panel two session, uh, which title is Promoting Competitive and Manageable Material Substitutes in Developing Countries. So here we're zooming in. Uh, some points that are important before we get into the session is that, that identifying uh, substitutes and alternatives is a moving target. There are many that are being identified as we advance, and we are uh, uh, contrasting them against life cycle analysis, but there might be others that could come in, and just mentioned by Daniela this morning, this afternoon, the issue of animal fibers, which also have potential. So it's it's uh, the term substitutes need to be understood in a dynamic way. It's going to be subject to many changes, including technology, life cycle analysis, recyclability, and many other aspects. Uh, I, I like to remind that this is an event organized by Ontagantes. I've been asked by the Geneva Environmental Network to also mention that there is a series of events called Beating the Plastic Pollution, and the next one will be on plastics in the mountains, mountain systems and ecosystems. So please also participate in that one. Now I'm going to give the floor to my colleague Enrique, who is going to really bring you to the analysis we have done on a basket of plastic substitutes and then the economics in terms of production and potential. Enrique, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Can you all see my screen? Yes, but put it in presentation mode, please. Perfect. Well, thanks again. Uh, it was very enriching to see the first panel and also the trade uh, angles related to this uh, transmaterialization, so the big transition that we want to have. Uh, it's nice to see this in perspective up to 1860, the world ran not on plastics, but on natural and mineral materials. And I think it will run again on those materials uh, very soon. So the, the, we are in the anomaly phase where we have to deal with this um, uh, issue. As a, as a pollution issue for a better systems design. So this presentation is also based on the work that has been done together with the Graduate Institute and TESS uh, on material substitutes as part of the SMEP program, which is supported by UK Aid. 
I'll not go very deep into the rationale of why transmaterializing, so why using substitute materials is important, because it has been properly explained by Mahesh. But there's a, a large potential there. It's not only a, a, a cost, but it's a potential window towards new uh, productive capacities and, and, and new value addition. Uh, and also it matches well with the pursuit of zero carbon growth. So leaving more of with the resources we have on, on Earth's surface and relying less on fossil um, inputs. I'll go straight to the to the options here. Um, I have already briefed some of the, the potentials. I'm more grounded here in the country cases that we explored in the upcoming study. I've been some questions about, I've seen some questions about when this study will be out. Anktad will publish this study probably in January, uh, the full uh, report. Uh, some of the speakers already got uh, an executive summary, so this is why some uh, made comments on it, especially Alice. But there will be a public version uh, very available very soon for all to read there. The analysis is much more developed there. So uh, alternatives, which are the alternatives we're talking about? I mean, looking at simple things, so that create big problems, like especially complex, uh, uh, especially, especially complicated single-use plastics like grocery bags or plates or straws. For every country, there is always one option or more than one option that can be used, like jute, jute, uh, paper, uh, cotton bags, bamboo materials, a lot of uh, processed agricultural residues. But there's one one, one bad boy in the in the in the neighborhood, sachets. Sachets have no very no good viable alternative. And if we, if we think in hindsight, we didn't use sachets before. It's a um, invention of modern of the 20th century, uh, a sad one, which uh, has a high cumulative effect. And we actually don't need to to uh, don't need sachets to leave. Sachets is an example of why the substitution effect is not enough on its own. We need to to have a different system that uses less single-use items because they're really not really necessary. The life cycle analysis component, which is gonna come in the study in more details, is very important because as Alice Tipping said, we need to look at the trade-offs. If we are changing A for B, we need to make sure that B delivers better environmental and social performance than A. So let's look at this uh, example here for Bangladesh, looking at uh, different types of, of, of bag alternatives. And we ran uh, a life cycle analysis uh, together in an Austrian group to check for each alternative uh, bag, what will be the life cycle impact compared to, to the baseline. So we saw that uh, uh, one of the critical one here is a cotton bag. Cotton bag has a high uh, environmental impact in all categories observed, such as freshwater eutrophication, marine eutrophication, uh, carcinogenic effects, because uh, cotton bags come from agri the agriculture upstream and, and, and raising growing cotton is an expensive ener energetically and environmentally endeavor. So we'd better make sure that the cotton bags are reused uh, many times uh, over and over again, and not only uh, replace uh, single use plastics and become a single use plastic uh, cotton bag, that would make no sense. This is a, there are many categories here. We did that for different types of, of products, but this just shows how uh, uh, impactful the, the alternative can be on the environment through LC analysis as well. If we look at an, the similar ana analysis for Nigeria, we can, uh, as previously mentioned, look at uh, animal fibers. We have wool bag here that have also a high environmental impact uh, considering its life cycle. Together with cotton bags, so wool bags uh, are uh, uh, an alternative we should watch out for. We should make sure that they are re really reused many times so that their, their environmental impacts are spread along the, the life of the product, hopefully a very long time, a long life of the product, and not only uh, being purchased, used once from the grocery to home and then uh, shelved. That will, be, that will be not a very good material transition. But this type of analysis, so understanding the trade-off, understanding where we are getting to is very important for uh, at the, both of the international um, multilateral level so, uh, to support negotiations such as uh, the WTO, the IDP, uh, the World Customs Organizations and others, but also at the national level to know what you're uh, uh, getting into in terms of, of trade-off choices. The expert, export profiles of, of those products, uh, especially the materials and the end-use products also tells an interesting story. If we look at uh, 
on the left side here, we're looking at uh, plastic and non-plastic feedstocks, so the materials used to make things. And we see that uh, the, the, the main important thing is to look at these orange bars. They represent net exports. So if net exports are negative, it means that the country has a debt. The country is importing uh, overall those materials. So you see that there's a systemic uh, net imports of plastics materials, in the case of of, uh, of Bangladesh here, and also uh, most 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 occasions also a systemic imports a net imports of alternative mat uh, uh, materials. So you see that this is this is a uh, this is a game that requires trade. So uh, most of those feedstocks are coming in from abroad and are being processed into other products. On the other side here, on the right side, you have uh, a view of the and use products. And, we, and the story is similar, except for jutes and some specific materials that have uh, high production in the case of Bangladesh, most other materials are still uh, for, for packaging uh, are, are still mostly imported. So that's, uh, that's an important thing to take into account when, uh, when promoting a substitute. The same, there's a similar dynamic here for, for Kenya, another, another case study that we examined into the upcoming report. Most plastic materials are in, uh, imported uh, overall, and uh, so are the alternative materials. And we can say the same for end use products, which are here, this uh, lower right area here. You can have, you can have an idea that, uh, for example, aluminum uh, boxes or glass uh, bottles, they are still overall uh, subject to net imports. So that's an important question for the national authorities. Cost issues, the report also looks at some, some issues related to costs. As our RPIT said, and things need to be price attractive to, to take place. And this report surveyed the price of simple items like paper bags and plastic bags or cups or plates in the markets of Bangladesh and the markets of Kenya. In Bangladesh, the price of plastics was generally lower than the plastic, the price of the alternative. So plastics were hard to compete with. And I got, I got the feeling myself, that, oh my God, the plastic is gonna be cheaper everywhere. So hard to, to, to tilt this, uh, this equation. Not really, in Kenya, we saw that the price of plastics and the subsidies were on a similar level. So there was not such a, a price difference. The, the, the ranges were in, in uh, overlapping. So that is to say, of course, uh, the, the, the scale of production of, of plastic bags or plastic straws is much higher than the scale of production of alternative bags and straws. So this can, this can be adjusted perhaps as if scales approach each other or if the scales of the alternatives grow past a certain point to become price competitive. Perhaps one, one, one way to do that is to act on public procurement, the government purchasing power has uh, the capacity to create enough uh, purchase or in enough market scale so that the prices of the alternatives shrink. Another thing I wanted to say, uh, those are bit, uh, pieces of information, but they, I think they all relate to the, the, the transmaterialization challenge, is the, the size of, of the problem. This is a, a, a slide uh, plagiarized from my colleague Davi, and we uh, looked at uh, the overall size of plastics uh, markets in intermediate forms uh, plastic goods, plastics, textiles, and polyester in the world. And um, I don't know if uh, I've, got, I've got the sense that when we talk about material alternatives, we mostly talk about, about packaging, about single use items. And uh, that's a small part of the, of the entire materials universe of plastics. So $53 billion compared to a trillion dollars uh, of overall plastics uh, usage. That is to say that we we might not uh, achieve uh, uh, healthier oceans or, or uh, better material systems by transmaterialization alone. We need other uh, uh, actions, uh, perhaps uh, Terry, one of the commentators can, can also develop, that will reduce overall usage of plastics and of materials overall. Okay, so better systems design. We cannot use the alternatives or the, the substitutes the same way we use plastics today. I'm approaching the end of the presentation. This uh, is, a, is a, 
a slide that shows that precision is necessary. If you want to legislate mm -hmm. anything on plastics uh, alternatives uh, or, or, or play with tariffs up or down, you need to have precise HS codes that are identifying what, what is plastics, what is uh, the alternative for each uh, category here. And the, the upcoming report, and uh, there's a fact sheet that we prepared, which can also be sent to the participants, shows that, uh, that well, there's a whole process ongoing at the World Customs Organization to update the HS codes as Mahesh presented. But this is very, very, very important. You cannot legislate, you cannot do policy, you cannot regulate, but you're not, you cannot measure. That's, a, that's, a, that's almost a rule in, in the public sector. Finally, we have the, the issue of, uh, again, uh, where are we getting into? Can we handle the trade-offs? Can we handle the downstream? If we change plastics for, for crop residues or for agricultural uh, uh, organic-based materials, for glass or mineral products or paper or clay, can we handle crop residues better than we handle, handle plastics? Can we handle clay better than we handle plastics? And together with some colleagues from the SMEP program, and UNCTAD, we plotted this small investigation here, looking at many, many uh, policy documents from uh, a few countries, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Nepal, and Kenya. We tried to dig out the recovery capacity for different types of materials that act as substitutes to plastics. And uh, we calculated their review compared to the advantage of them as an, as an idea of how competitive they are or they could be uh, in, that, in a specific country. So we noticed that uh, most countries have, they struggle to, to have a, a high recovery recycling rate for materials other than plastics. Yeah. And we, uh, we also see that the materials which are highly recovered are, are the user, is the usual suspect. Aluminium is very highly priced. People uh, uh, pick it and recover it. And, but uh, they are often not very competitive or imported or reliant on uh, a high value addition uh, uh, industries that are often uh, abroad. So it's quite a challenge. Ideally, you want to have the plastics substitutes in this area here where it's both competitive and you have a good downstream management. So you have good, good waste management or end of life management of the alternative residue. Finally, to close, uh, in order to, to, to keep some questions for, for discussion for the commentators here, we should look at the, the, the trade-offs. We should look at the alternatives as uh, 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 a, a, road, a new road to that we are taking. So, and how to look at that? I think one one of the best ways is to look at life cycle analysis of the alternative. Hey, we need to look at system designs change, not only change the material that will not solve the problem, and work with precise HS codes to have uh, focused target uh, action uh, areas for for tariff uh, uh, liberalization and, and, and stimulus. We also should look at the downstream should look at what type of recovery and recycling capacities we have at hand for the alternatives. Should like look at cost and competitiveness. Why in some cases the cost of the alternative or the, the, the substitutes is higher than the cost of plastics. What can we do to address it? Perhaps uh, public procurement can be one of the ways. Or yeah. And um, or, or working through, value, through, through regional uh, blocks to increase the, the scale of markets, not only uh, limited to national markets. And finally, uh, uh, we, also, we also see that uh, the challenge of shifting materials is a challenge of value addition. We need to, to keep promoting uh, productive capacity so that countries can develop a level of uh, value addition and transform uh, whatever alternative or substitute material they, they have at hand into into, into end use products, which are actually the things people use and things that go to, to, the, to, to the economic system. I'll stop here. Uh, Davi, I uh, just mentioned that again, that we have the full study out uh, in January, uh, in, which is, was produced in cooperation with the Graduate Institute and with the SMAP program funded by uh, UK FCDO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrique. I think there are many, many points coming from your presentation. One important one is that substitution is only one part of a larger solution where you need also to reduce, reduce and recycle as has been mentioned by many. So it's just a contribution. The other angle that I think is very important is that when you're talking about substitutes, you're talking about uh, a circular uh, sustainable industrial policy, which is important because you're trying to change the way we produce and consume and offer alternatives in the market that can be sooner than later. And that's another important message. Substitutes that have been mentioned 
are already available and could be scaled up in a relatively short period of time in many countries. So that's perhaps one of the main features of substitutes over other policies because just bringing recycling to all developing countries in the next 20 years is going to take a little bit a little bit of effort to really scale up and implies a lot of investments where substitutes could be a, a spearhead by the private sector with support of the governments now we have uh, uh, three fantastic uh, commentators uh, number one will be mr devara brata chabrokti I hope I pronounced it well, who is consular at the permanent mission of Bangladesh. We have listened to Bangladesh a lot today, especially in relation to youth. And you have an important supply side and value addition capacity in this case. Uh, coming from Latin America, we always uh, get the youth bags for cocoa and coffee uh, from Bangladesh. So we are an important user of these materials. Uh, Debrata, please welcome and your comments. Um, uh, thank you. Uh... Thank you, uh, all colleagues. Uh, I, I shouldn't attribute uh, separately, but really grateful for this invitation. Uh, colleagues from ANCTAD, SMEP, UK, and TESS. Uh, I also uh, thank uh, colleagues uh, David and Enric for, for his uh, fabulous presentation. I should say that it captures well, it's a good case study, at least a good beginning, I should say, uh, the way uh, it has dealt uh, detail. Of course, we are very much looking forward to the study in detail, uh, although we just received uh, just the executive summary of promoting competitiveness and manageable material substitute in developing countries. And, and of course, David, you are right that uh, like Bangladesh, many countries are producing substitute, but the most important part is whether they are competitive. And I think uh, if, if you ask me what is the crux or the jewel of this study, I should, I should tell that this, uh, this revelation of this techno-economic assessment that shows, that particularly in these three countries, including my own country, Bangladesh, that for some materials, the domestic industry is simply not ready to produce the products required as, as a skill that enable a shift away from existing products. So although we have identified some uh, substitutes that we have, but simply the domestic industry is not ready. And there are different reasons. And I think in the next series of studies, next series of researches, those uh, issues should be uh, also focused, of course. And I, I take your point that you have repeated that substitution is only one part of the solution, but of course uh, there are many. Um, uh, of course, if we just uh, go to Bangladesh, of course, the role of tariff and everything that has been covered in this uh, study are quite, uh, of course, important. But uh, particularly, uh, of course, the two ways we, we earlier marked and the study also uh, highlighted that uh, tariff measures plus other regulatory measures. I can tell you a little bit of very recent development uh, during the last couple of months in Bangladesh uh, under the order of the, our Supreme Court. So there is now a new uh, coastal area plan to use of sustainable uh, uh, use of single uh, single plastic or single use of plastics, better to say, because it is a hazard and the court has asked the government to to put policy in place and it has just put only last month. So uh, 12 di di uh, districts uh, of the coastal area are now under that plan and they are supposed to uh, take some concrete measures and report back to the Supreme Court within next three years. So this is the kind of defined time period that the court has given and the government has started working on. So this is one piece of information, uh, particularly uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, we also have one uh, action plan on sustainable use of plastics. Uh, so that is uh, uh, that also uh, is basically uh, done under the solid waste management rules of 2021 that has been just finalized only last week. So this is just most recent, and this has uh, you know inscribed the use of biodegradable plastic bags for disposing waste uh, for household and both for the I mean small um, industries. Also, uh, uh, it has put annual reporting system on plastic recycling by all producers and importers of plastics. There is also a separate section on the single use of plastics uh, in, in the annual reporting. And it uh, has also included this extended producer responsibility of EPR that uh, both Mahesh and Enric uh, has pointed out in their reports. And of course, uh, it has included the life cycle analysis of plastic. So these are the pretty recent initiatives of the government. Uh, but I know that regulation is regulation. They need to be uh, promulgated. 
Uh, and we all know that the Jute Act, and this report has also pointed out this, the Jute Act of 2021 uh, pointed out, and uh, it has made compulsory for all producers of six essential items for production and distribution, like paddy, rice, wheat, maize, fertilizer, and sugar. Uh, they should use jute bags or jute bag covers uh, as compulsory thing. And uh, our crops plan, that is the major uh, plan document for Bangladesh government, and now the eighth five-year plan, which uh, will continue from 2021 to 2026, that has also emphasized the uh, phasing out of uh, this uh, SUPS. So, so these are uh, something, but I have also a question on, on these, and I, I know that the time is very short, but when I compare the data in this report, particularly this executive summary of these case studies uh, the, and the UNCTAD report, that for Bangladesh, they have used uh, 2015. I know that the availability of data is a question, but for Kenya and Nigeria, uh, they have used that from 2019. So I've just questioned whether this data is so scarce uh, for Bangladesh. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, jute, which uh, of course David, you have also pointed out, we have in Bangladesh comparative advantage, uh, but also there is a new innovation that is uh, garment, uh, garments or ready-made garments with cotton, what is called jute, uh, is pronounced uh, sounds similar. So it's, it's not, jute means in Bengali language, not the real one. That means it looks like jute, but not jute. So it's jute. So it's basically remnants of the garments and uh, they are assembled and uh, made for the paper sack uh, or thread sacks like that. Another important thing that I must uh, want to say, particularly from Bangladesh, that COVID-19 has increased the use of uh, single use of plastics. I'm not quite sure whether this is the case in other countries, but I think in the next version of study or revision, this issue uh, can be taken care of. This is an important aspect. The report that I'm hearing from my colleagues in Bangladesh that, uh, of course, after the uh, pandemic, the single use of plastic uh, has been increased, particularly in different formats and, and covers of different therapeutics and others. Uh, well, on, on the other substitutes like use of paper, cups, and plates, so uh, I'm not quite sure how much pressure we are creating on trees, but this is quite important as we have written in our note that from uh, uh, taking care of one ingredient of, of pollution, are we uh, suppressing any, any other area, uh, particularly whether this use of plastic cups, uh, if not uh, paper cups, if not uh, from the recycled paper, uh, it, it will be resulting in deforestation. And I think like Bangladesh for many countries, it will be a big cost, a big price. Um, so enough has been uh, told about jute. Of course, Bangladesh is ready with jute, but uh, one question is there, uh, we don't have uh, right kind of R&D or enough, or I should say, we don't have enough R&D uh, technology and, and there is no scale up of that. The recent example is one, uh, Dr. Mubarak's innovative idea on uh, from jute byproducts, uh, shopping bag. So this is really biodegradable. And um, I was in charge of an institution before coming to Geneva. And I have personally uh, examined that within a couple of weeks, this is just soluble to water. So this is a very good initiative, but there are many initiatives like that from jute or any other agriculture byproducts, but developing countries need you know, support uh, for that. And food safety is also another concern. If we go too much of the uh, agriculture for many countries, whether are we exchanging or uh, putting uh, food safety in, in severity uh, in, in exchange of single use of plastic. So that is another area where I think more light should be focused. Uh, colleagues, I also want to uh, point out another important event resolution that was passed in 21st November 2091 and uh, that says resolution on natural plant fibers. This is the even resolution for common that calls upon the governments to mainstream the promotion of the natural fibers into their policies, plans, and laws. I think this is a time to call all, uh, at least to utilize this. Uh, in in Antar's work, we can utilize this as well uh, for, for other areas as well. So this is, of course, uh, an internationally agreed uh, document. On aluminum as substitute, as Mahesh and both uh, Henrik has pointed out, of course, this is a good substitute, but I have a question once again, uh, because uh, the reports I have read, uh, not only from Bangladesh, but also from some other developing countries, that aluminum cans might indeed means less ocean waste, but they come with their own eco price. The production of each can pumps about twice as much carbon into atmosphere as each plastic bottle. Now, how then it's a good substitute to save uh, or are we going to 
pollute the earth, either to save land or, I mean, what is the cost to save land in, in, in the cost of price of air? So that's the, that's the common question. But I think this is not the question from Bangladesh only, from many other countries, people will be asking this question. So um, for priority setting, this is another aspect that uh, our colleagues in Ankara and SEP can, just can uh, think over that in, in many developing countries and LDCs particularly, there are many challenges and among those challenges, there are different competitive sectors that dominate and single use of plastic or its substitute measures may lag behind. So how more policy space could be promoted there? That's a big question and a big challenge in, in many of our countries as well. So if I may uh, come towards uh, almost conclusion for this, uh, it's really encouraging that Amtad and uh, colleagues are doing this thing but uh, as you know that in many developing countries like LDCs are included, we have unique challenges. And of course we have limited resources and comparatively for bigger population. And uh, we also have limited implementation capacity. So what is minimum environmental standard as many colleagues have pointed out today uh, and its compliance in one country may be out of the capacity in low income countries. And as they do not have viable technological base, uh, if the environmentally friendly industrial goods are too costly, the LDC simply cannot afford uh, those. I mean, I, of course, I indicate this uh, life cycle uh, analysis as well, because for those you need heavy industrial support as well. Uh, and of course, can, for developing- can we, can we wrap up? Because we have other two commentators yeah. and time so my, is my, my final point would be that appropriate technology must be supported to the LDCs, particularly after TRIP 66.2, plus uh, this SDG 17.7, that of course calls for environmentally sound technology for developing countries. And uh, we must look, look for the implementation of those uh, commitments as, as well. So with that, I once again, thank you. It's a, it's a fabulous uh, round table, I should say, and we should continue this sort of discussion. I thank you all. Thank you very much for the useful comments. Interesting from the point of view of Bangladesh. Very, very relevant comments. I, I like the point on, on, on the marine protected areas. I also work on the oceans program as a also complementary measure. The importance of an, of an action plan on plastics. This is something that the UN can help. There is not a standard or a unique framework to do that. And a point in general to many of your questions is there is no perfect material. You know, uh, All materials have an environmental cost unless they are services. So we cannot deliver and consume food and many products through e-commerce we need to we need to always use some sort of material and there are some better than others and that's what we're trying to do here trying to identify which could be the better ones and again that question will change the the answer to that question will change uh, with time and with technology you know because it's not a, again not is this a movie target i'm gonna leave now the floor to mr george richels who is a, a senior a counselor and senior technical spe, a, a specialist as the organization of eastern caribbean states he represents nine countries uh, all very active in the front of fighting against plastic pollution and single-use plastics. They have a different experience. They are working a lot on oceans economy, on blue biotrade, including the use of seaweeds as potential elements, bagasse, and other uh, agricultural waste that they have in the region to try to find a transition to our lower plastic economy. Joel, welcome. You're a good friend of Onta Gantes. Welcome to, the, to this event. Thank you very much, David. And, uh... Very pleased to be part of this roundtable discussion. And uh, let me thank the uh, previous panel and commenters, as well as the current uh, panel. Um, thanks to uh, Henrique in particular for what was certainly an excellent and balanced analysis and um, Dev who also brought some uh, considerable balance to our conversation. Uh, as you rightly said, David, I'm representing the organization of Eastern Caribbean states. And uh, to date, we have many Caribbean countries, uh, including four of the OECS member states, which would be Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that have all placed a ban on the use and import of single-use plastics and styrofoam. The improper disposal of plastics continues to harm marine life, underwater ecosystems, and of course, the climate. According to the United Nations Environment Program, the Caribbean Sea is the second most plastic contaminated sea in the world after the Mediterranean Sea. UNEP estimates that 600 to over 1400 plastic items per square kilometer 
end up in the Caribbean Sea. And it's really against this background that I commend the organizers for today's roundtable session, as well as both UNTAD and SMEP for the studies and the reports. I am certainly pleased to be part of this conversation, as I said before, but I'm also hoping that in the very near future, that this important body of work can benefit from empirical inputs from the Caribbean, given our more systemic interest in the area of plastics pollution as well. I want to focus my brief intervention on the challenges from an economic and policy perspective of material substitution in small countries like ours in the OECS that have limited productive capacities. And the first point I really want to make, and uh, some of what I'll be saying also came out in, 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 in what some of the previous speakers said, and I will attempt to elaborate as efficiently as I can. But, but the first point I want to raise is with respect to the need for efficient policy management. And uh, any kind of policy change typically requires strategies for responding to unintended consequences of that policy. And this often needs to come through some form of compensating uh, variation. And it's really in that context, we have to also look at the whole issue of transitioning away from plastics and how we go about in terms of incorporating substitutes into our everyday lives. Now, policymakers must be in a position to anticipate the adjustment strategies of firms as those firms seek to minimize costs while also sustaining market share. And that is usually the tension, and, and it's been the tension that a number of our firms have had to face, especially firms that are involved in the uh, production of plastics and uh, plastic materials. Um, it's really about how do we minimize cost? How do we transition? But how do we also maintain market share in, in that context? Now, in some Caribbean countries already, uh, the majority of our supermarkets, for example, have initiated adjustments through initiatives to replace single-use plastics with re reusable shopping bags, for example, uh, many restaurants have also begun adjustments to the use of more biodegradable food service materials. Some governments have also proposed fiscal adjustments to encourage private sector investment in the domestic production of alternatives to single-use plastics and have generally adopted a phased approach to implementation. And this phased approach is certainly important in a context where you need to give the private sector sufficient time to make the adjustments that they are being called on to, to make. It is also very important to consider strategies for rewarding potential losses uh, for businesses, which might not be able to fully adjust to the new policy requirements over the short term. This is very important since revised policy could force some firms to either radically alter their operation strategy where that is possible or to ultimately seize operations. And again, this is another tension that tends to take place in, in markets uh, such as ours, especially very, very small markets. The second issue I want to mention relates to uh, how policy implementation tends to have different impacts on different sectors and industries. Uh, so for example, transitioning to other types of packaging can result in other costs for firms, which could result in even more substantial costs to some business entities. Uh, one such possibility is with respect to increased uh, post-harvest losses uh, to vegetable market operators, uh, if we use that example uh, for, uh, in the context of, of, of the farming sector. For, for, uh, for example, if single-use plastic replacements do not provide the same shelf life longevity, as currently utilized plastic products do, then that creates a, a sort of a, a difficulty uh, for persons who, who, who um, are in those types of industries. A similar dynamic could also emerge, particularly in the case of uh, persons who are in the food service industry, restaurants, supermarkets, uh, catering, and they tend to face added costs to meet new or different food safety or public health requirements consequent upon the adoption of alternatives to single-use uh, packaging. 
I want to in particular highlight the printing and packaging subsector because we do have some limited production in our jurisdictions uh, where, where, this is, where this subsector is concerned. And what we've seen is that it has faced a significant short-term reduction in current output demand with potential for substantial financial losses because the requirement has been that uh, where there's a ban on single-use plastics, then you need to phase out all of your current production. And that, with that comes a significant amount of uh, financial losses. And this then brings into perspective the whole idea of the additional social ramifications in the form of job losses, uh, the implications of the need for transition support to sectors negatively affected so that they could possibly become viable players in the production of environmentally friendly alternatives to single use uh, plastics in the in the future. Uh, the third point I will make, and, and very quickly, David, is that there are unaccounted costs of single-use plastics, which may also accrue outside of the firm. And these externality costs uh, include environmental impacts, such as flooding due to the accumulations of single-use plastics in water courses, and there are public health impacts related to bioaccumulation of microplastics in the food chain and release threats to wildlife and marine fauna. And of course, the despoiling of beaches and other recreational areas. Uh, the mitigation cost of at least some of these additional um, costs should also be taken into account in any kind of cost benefit analysis and scenarios in order to fully assess the full impact of any proposed policies. Now, the application of an enhanced single use plastic strategy is likely to be maximally efficient if it is accompanied by a much more comprehensive and robust national waste management program, which builds more efficient institutions, strengthens the waste management regulatory framework, and improves waste management incentives. This is important since in the absence of more rigorous waste management regime, even the disposal of alternatives could in turn become the source of additional externality costs to the economy. And I think uh, Enrique did allude to um, some of, I think, what he referred to as the need for better systems also to reduce the environmental impact of some of the alternatives. And this point I just made, I think, fits really into that um, context very, very neatly. Uh, the fifth point I'll make, and, and penultimate point, is that there's a need for a more finely attuned fiscal incentive framework in small developing countries, in developing countries across the board, which could stimulate the strengthening of the overall circular economy. Uh, now, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, where many of our governments are, have, uh, are facing with, with serious fiscal constraints and, and fiscal deficits and gaps, uh, this is going to be difficult, but that's perhaps where some external support come in. And such fiscal frameworks will support the monetization of most forms of waste, reduce waste production, enhance recycling, and also penalize indiscriminate waste disposal. And the final point I want to make, and as we talk about alternatives to plastics, is that there is a significant opportunity for innovation, for investment, for production expansion, and for the emergence of new sectors and subsectors. And of course, there are the spillover effects or benefits for welfare gains for the entire society, including the environment on a whole. And in pursuing plastic substitutes, it is extremely important that we do not perpetuate long-standing structural inequalities where global production is concerned. Um, in the OECS, we, as I mentioned before, we have very small uh, economies and we do not have very robust manufacturing bases, but that does not preclude the possibility of being able to develop some indigenous manufacturing capacity where um, plastics alternatives are concerned. And I believe that we should spare no effort in ensuring that countries like ours are also uh, placed in a position where we can also produce and not necessarily simply replicate old patterns of relying almost exclusively 
on imports to satisfy our market requirements. Uh, David, I think I'll leave it there for now and uh, I'll be happy to engage um, further in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. And you bring many, many important points. I just will summarize some. You put the point of the vulnerability of seeds to plastic pollution. You know, seeds are not only vulnerable to climate change, not vulnerable, only vulnerable to financial shocks, but also plastic pollution. So it's it's really a challenge for them. Also the importance of the, and the impacts of, uh, of uh, plastic pollution to the blue economy, the importance of having waste management systems, fiscal incentives, and national policies and plans. So thank you very much, Joel. Uh, also, I, we put in the chat an example that we helped in Jamaica on the use of bamboo to do a straws and substitute them in plastic. So it's a very nice experience. Also a company led by women, which is very nice. Now we have a, 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 a very important expert coming at the end. We have uh, the best for the end. We have Terry McCormack, who is going to uh, go deeper into more the technical analysis life cycle, which are the most uh, environmentally friendly substitutes, why we should go there and what could be the options moving forward. Thank you, Terry, for your time and welcome. Uh, we're all going a little bit late. I will ask participants to bear with us, but I see a lot of interest. We have not gone down uh, almost in participants. Terry, please. Uh, thank you, David. Um, if the people aren't dropping off, they probably will in a few minutes as I get started. Um, my thanks to Tad and to Henrik, and uh, it's good to see Tess involved. That was my nickname at university where I studied uh, chemistry. Um, I want to make a, a few more general uh, observations regarding the report and um, there is a line in there which says which cites the severe impact of plastics produ production on the global carbon budget through to the end of the century um, but I would strike a more optimistic term regarding business as usual because I think the plastics industry is well aware of the challenges associated with circular economy pollution and resource efficiency also at the sector level um, I think researchers such as those involved in packaging development uh, display a very high level of ingenuity. Innovation was just touched on there. So the landscape is changing, maybe not quickly enough, but it is certainly changing. Um, so when we have references in the report also to uh, plastics per se, rather than only the majority emphasis, which I think should be placed, which is on linear, linear economy, plastics waste and pollution. Um, so I think, you know, we need to, to have that deep uh, focus uh, in mind. Regarding life cycle thinking and plastics, which have been mentioned, I think it's important to not only concentrate on production and end of life. So we're fixated by manufacturing impacts and uh, waste, but also to consider the use phase. Um, the reasons for the deployment of plastics in applications in, in the first place. And often you will see that greenhouse gas savings in the use phase outweigh those of manufacturing and end of life impacts combined. And I think these potential savings should be considered when we're looking at substitutes going forward. Regarding substitute materials, um, this is the upstream, uh, upstream innovation area. There are likely to be trade-offs that's been said and compromises uh, as not only, you know, Plastics have been in these applications for a long time. They're well, um, you know, they're, they've been optimized. They have a good LCA profile. Um, although I, I take the point that we have to recognize the external, the negative externalities like littering when we think about life cycle analyses. Um, but the incumbent plastics tend to possess good functionality. They're available and they are affordable. So they have a lot of things going in their favor. So several things to take into consideration as we look at substitution. I think for substitution in general, the starting point may be those challenged plastics items. Uh, and these are those that are prone to littering or ending up in the environment. They often represent a poor selection of choice in plastics anyway. Uh, so going forwards, introduce new alternative feedstocks into these applications. As they gain traction, then we can build upon this going forward and carry out the requisite development to address some of the more sophisticated applications. So to ensure that these new feedstocks um, can, can bed down going forward. So be selective, seek quick wins, 
where there's going to be little resistance, demonstrate the potential, establish the track record, uh, and then um, you know, promote these new and alternative feedstocks and materials further. I do have a slide, but I don't know if you have time to put this up, and this is the, the SMEP um, program. Let me see if I can. Please share it, and also you can give it to us, and we can put it in the chat for everybody to have it. Okay. Um, it's just for those who are not familiar with the... Not that one. Let's answer another one of the questions in the chat. This one. Now I'm struggling to get the right. Uh, but but tell us that while while you do tell us uh, what will be the content so we can. Okay, but but basically, um, it is a picture of the. Uh, the scope of the SMEP program. So this is the call that was made for um, solutions to plastics pollution. And um, basically, let me find it in my thing here. Um, basically, the majority of the uh, solutions that came forward um, concentrated on the end of pipe um, type of solutions. So they involve the repurposing or the remanufacturing of plastics waste from fast moving consumer goods area um, and turning them into uh, disposable items. So going from single use to disposable or uh, dur durable durable products. And um, it, meant, it meant that there is a recognition of plastics waste as a resource. Increasingly, it's seen as a uh, an important resource. So this valorization of the waste materials demonstrates that waste is a prize and that there is a market. And I think the more that can happen, the less you will see material plastics materials being discarded, um, you know, in the environment. Um, so as I say, a lot of these were around end of pipe solutions, which um, emanate from single use formats such as packaging um, and applying what I would say is an open loop or an extended loop uh, approach to, um, you know, to these materials, giving them a second life and following uh, circular economy principles. But I think as we've, we're talking about here, one of the things that we wanted to look at was stemming the flow of plastics pollution in the first place, and that requires the upstream interventions. Uh, so that brings in the substitutes, the alternative material solutions that some of which have been touched upon today. Um, but I would say that furthermore, we, we also ask people to think about not just substitution, because there may be cases where it's not really viable. How about looking at new models of consumption? So um, is there another way of um, uh, providing the service to society um, through a better design um, of, uh, of product, for example, and a different way of consuming? So we also ask for this. Uh, and we also ask people to look at industrial symbiosis approaches along the, <clears throat> the production and the supply chains. Uh, so taking waste and using it as a, um, uh, as a resource. Um, within the scope as well of this particular program, we, we brought in the uh, potential for biodegradable materials, uh, as long as they applied in the correct context. Uh, being mindful of the ramifications for, you know, existing waste management um, and, and so forth. So really, that is the the additional kind of um, elements I wanted to uh, to bring in here in a rather synthetic way. Um, I, I, I heard the point around policy developments. Yes, that's very important uh, to supplement the uptake of new solutions, particularly extended producer responsibility schemes, because that's a way to provide the finance to achieve. Uh, higher recycling rates uh, and even to promote uh, recycled content uh, going forward. So there we are, rather synthetic, um, but um, that's all I want to say at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Terry. This was very useful, especially the importance of 
of opportunities for design, most of delivery, delivery business models that could also help to reduce even without having to use plastics. And also the point on the extended pro responsibility and producer responsibility. This is very interesting. In Ontario, we have a competition policy unit and consumer protection unit. I think we need to bridge to explore that more from the point of view of the liability of the companies, uh, whether as stored or directly on their legal uh, scope and regulations. So, so I think uh, we have gone to the to, to the list of commentators. Enrique, one minute, and perhaps we should go to closing on any questions, points you want to make before we close. Thank you, Daphie, and thank you. Uh, thanks all the commentators. Uh, those are really good points. We are taking notes uh, about uh, the comment commentary provided so that we can write a small commentary article afterwards. And then uh, I, I myself will sleep over tonight with a lot of food for thought. So yeah, uh, substitute materials, they, they have their own scenes. They have their own choices to be made uh, at the trade level or at the local level. Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Joel said, uh, they, they have a special uh, impact on, on larger and smaller uh, economy, especially on, on small island states. And um, it's part of the equation. As we've seen the overall market for plastics, we will not substitute it for the different materials. We have to redesign things. Instead of getting soap in a sachet, we need to get soap in a bar or in a different system that we used to do before for hundreds of years. And and, and those things can be done, can be re-implemented with a, with a high-tech fashion as we have many tools today. I don't have more comments now. I'd just uh, like to announce because there were many uh, questions from the audience on whether the report is out. The report will be out in January. What we are going to do, we're going to send a post-meeting email with some information, some references, uh, uh, the fact sheets on HS codes, and also our, 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 the study that ANCTA just published today on uh, uh, the ANCTA mandate and the governance uh, for plastics alternatives. So yeah, that'll be uh, all from my side. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, David. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we're going down to closing. First, I would like to thank our partner Tess for, for their wonderful support over this year. Also, we would like to recall that there are three important multilateral processes, perhaps fourth in the future, related to plastics. There will be discussions in the United Nations Environmental Assembly in March that may lead to a new mandate on a potential treaty on plastic pollution. There is also the informal dialogue on plastics. Uh, this is a learning process. This is a quest. So please engage. Uh, I think it's important to be part of the solution and not of the problem. So I would encourage all member states to really join and explore together with our support all the potential solutions for this big problem. Also, uh, as was mentioned by Caroline, uh, ONTA got a new mandate for the first time. We got a mandate of plastic, so we're happy to work with all partners, whether uh, member states, international governmental uh, organizations, civil society, in this quest. You are not alone will help you to reach sustainable development by 2030 or early if possible. So thank you very much to all. Also final thanks to everybody that made this possible. Caroline, Michael, Annalise, uh, Daniela, uh, Zebatra, Henrique, Joel, Mahesh, Terry, etc. for this wonderful event. And as uh, uh, we will keep you in touch, please look at the websites of both tests. Uh, uh, an ONTAC and also the Geneva Environmental Network. And uh, finally, I would like to mention that we uh, one of the takeaways from this event is that we would like to also explore opportunities in enlarging that list of substitutes to other products and explore with other organizations on that matter. Uh, uh, Enrique, Caroline, any final word you may want to say? And we close. Caroline, over to you. Uh, I think, sorry, I think Caroline had to leave early, so she's just, uh, she conveyed her, her regrets. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you again. And I mean, thank you also to Antat for the opportunity. I think it was a great session and I really look forward to interacting with, with all of you and also with Antat and uh, on, on these issues. And I think there's a lot more exciting work to be done ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a just lovely a, day. Just a final thanks to the to the sponsor of the well, one of the sponsors of this session, FCDO, which uh, sponsors the Sustainable Manufacturing and Environmental Environmental Pollution Program. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Goodbye.